Elon Musk's Neuralink implant enabled a human with paralysis to play chess online. But lawmaker Earl Blumenauer has raised concerns to the FDA about whether it should be tested in humans at all. Joining us right now is Dr. Scott Gottlieb. He's former FDA commissioner, board member of Illumina and Pfizer, and a CNBC contributor. Um, Dr. Gottlieb, let's start out with this story because it's one we've been following pretty closely. There are questions that are being raised by this lawmaker about whether the FDA should have approved human trials before they actually did their investigations and checked out the company. What do you think? Well, look, I would imagine the FDA did investigate um, some of the allegations that were surfaced publicly about the conduct of those animal trials. It's not at all clear that the people who are overseeing the human trials here, and they probably aren't the same people who oversaw those animal trials, and it's not a foregone conclusion that the company itself did those animal studies. A lot of times these are outsourced. I think from an FDA regulatory standpoint, if there were real allegations of poor handling of the animals in those preclinical studies, um, that would probably heighten the scrutiny that FDA, would, that FDA would apply to the trial more broadly, including the human uh, aspects of the trial, the phase one, phase, you know, the, the trials with, uh, with human subjects. And so I suppose the FDA did that, that they're looking at the company's oversight of clinical trials and their protocols that they have in place to ensure good governance of those trials. I, I would imagine that if there were real findings with respect to how the animals were handled in these studies or just mere allegations of that, and the FDA um, did an investigation, did an inspection, that that would heighten their scrutiny in terms of how they would look at the human trials as well. I mean, I've been completely impressed with what I've seen uh, just from the ability of this paralyzed individual, this gentleman, to, to be able to play online chess. What he said about it was pretty phenomenal. Um, other people have said, no, there's been research like this done before. You know a lot more about this. What are your thoughts on it? Well, there's a number of companies working on these um, brain-computer interfaces. Two other companies have FDA clearance to conduct human studies. There's been about 40 implants. There was a federal study back in 2022 looking across this, uh, this category and documented about 40 cases where these devices had been implanted uh, in human subjects. And so this is a technology that we've been working on for a while. Neuralink is another entrant into this space. I do believe it has promise, um, the ability to read electrical waves off of the brain and be able to correlate how those would um, line up with certain outputs, certain intended outputs, is a technology that we've been working on for a long time. We collectively mean the research community. A lot of this is based on machine learning. You're looking at patterns for the electrical impulses put off by the brain and trying to determine how those would translate into intended actions and then trying to stimulate those actions either through a computer or through a mechanized device that the user may wear to try to restore some partial function for someone who, for example, is a quadriplegic. So these technologies, that's I think, amazing. have a lot of promise. Other companies are working on it. Yeah, I mean, that's amazing. Whoever invents it, fantastic. Kudos to all of them for trying to push this research forward. Um, Scott, while you're here, let's talk about another issue we were talking about this morning. You were listening in. Um, we were talking about the approval of Merck's new, new treatment for a deadly lung condition. It sounds, again, like an amazing advance, but it's pretty hefty uh, in terms of the price tag. Yeah, look, this is a very promising drug. This is the first drug to attack an underlying mechanism that causes disease progression, the vascular proliferation that we see in this disease. And it's a devastating disease affecting about 40,000 Americans. Um, the price is high. It's higher than what people were anticipating. There were some external groups that were uh, estimating what a cost-effective price would be. ICER is one of those groups. They usually come in very low. They were estimating something in the range of thirty-five dollars to $40,000 a year. This is coming in at $238,000 a year based on the $14,000 price per vial that's administered every three weeks. About two-thirds of the population is covered by Medicare and Medicaid, so about one-third will be commercially insured. So we'll see what the government does with the pricing of this and how they push back with some of the authorities they have under the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. But uh, this is a really promising breakthrough. Merck, remember, had acquired this asset um, back in 2021 when they did the Acceleron acquisition for about $11.5 billion. This was originally being developed for certain forms of blood cancer, like multiple myeloma. Did it work with multiple myeloma, or is this the only indication that it's been approved for? Because that was a, a, an $11 billion acquisition. 
Right. So at the time that Merck acquired the company, this was a lead asset, was being developed by then for um, this indication. Celgene had been working with the company to try to develop in certain blood disorders and blood cancers. Those trials didn't work. They had pivoted already to this indication. Uh, there was another marketed drug that they also, Merck also acquired with that acquisition. It uh, does about $500 uh, uh, million dollars in sales. So it's not a very big drug from the standpoint you know, of the blockbusters that pharmaceutical companies usually go after. So this was the lead asset that they were they were going after with that acquisition. I mean, maybe that explains why these drugs are so expensive. The only way to get things to market is to get bought up by a bigger company, which has the ability and resources to get things through the FDA approval process and get it to market. It costs a lot of money for those acquisitions, $11 billion. If you're looking at why drugs are so expensive, that may be part of the issue. Yeah, look, and I also would say that a lot of the price controls in the marketplace also push up these launch prices because a company like Merck knows they're going to have to discount very heavily, especially into the Medicaid population, into 340B. So that $238,000 per year price isn't the price they're actually going to get after they have to pay some mandatory discounts across the entire marketplace. So they push up the launch prices and the list prices, knowing that they're going to have to discount a good portion of that back to the government and the commercial insurers. So we need to be mindful of that, too. This is going to probably be heavily utilized within the 340B population. Um, so that's a very big program right now that causes the forces mandatory discounts back to, uh, back to the insurers.